Well, it's 12 one. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to the first event in this new virtual series, Food, Nutrition and Healthy Aging, Lunch with the HNRC Nutrition Experts. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, all of you, alumni, guests, friends, families, colleagues, for joining us today. My name is Jose Rodovas, and I am a senior scientist and leader of the Nutrition and Genomics team. I have been with the HNRCA for about four decades, and I certainly know this place. But some of you may not be so familiar, so I will tell you that the Jan Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Resource Center on Aging at Tufts University is one of the six human nutrition resource centers supported by the United States Department of Agriculture and one of the largest research centers in the world studying nutrition and its relation to healthy aging and physical activity. And during the next few weeks, you will have the chance to learn more about what is being done uh, at the HNRC. Now let's go over the, the format of the event. First, it would be my honor to introduce to our inaugural speaker, uh, Simeon Maidani. She will be speaking for about 20 minutes and during that time, you will have the opportunity to use the Zoom's uh, Q&A uh, feature to post your questions. Uh, that Simin will address after her talk. The time allocated for the uh, Q&A will be about 15 minutes. Also, pay attention to the chat, just in case we have to convey some, uh, any message to you. Uh, remember that this is a Zoom call. Uh, I mean, this is not a Zoom call, this is a Zoom webinar, therefore only the host and the co-host will be visible and audible. Therefore, now you can relax, listen and eat your lunch, as the name of the series implies. Let me now uh, introduce uh, Simin. Uh, Simin Maidani is director of the Immunology Laboratory at the HNRC. She is also a professor in the Friedman School uh, of uh, uh, Nutrition Science and Policy and professor of immunology um, at the Tufts University School of uh, Graduate Biochemical Sciences. Uh, she has uh, been holding many positions that included uh, the Vice Provost for Research at Tufts University. She was also the director of the HNRC for quite a few years and uh, her scientific interests include the impact of nutrition on aging and age-associated diseases uh, and its role in immune and inflammatory responses and, pred and predisposition to infectious diseases. So it's a, it's a topic that obviously is uh, very much relevant in the times that we live. She is an internationally recognized scholar with over 350 publications. She has been she has uh, continued federal and non-federal funding. She was also the president of the American uh, Society for Nutrition and the president of the American Aging Association. Um, she has been serving in uh, you know many different academic governments uh, and uh, corporate communities and member of uh, grand review panels editorial board and so on and so forth. So, uh, Simin, the audience is here to listen to you. So let's start. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jose, for that uh, nice introduction, kind introduction. And um, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have this conversation with you. Um, I'm going to start with some introductory slides because I know this is a mixed audience. So I want everyone to be on the same page. Um, so when our body encounters a pathogen, which is a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or, or anything that can cause diseases, the immune system responds in two ways. Uh, one is what is referred to as cell-mediated immunity, which is basically producing uh, uh, antibodies against that pathogen on one hand that, and also direct killing of that particular pathogen. It also produces a series of inflammatory responses, which is also very important in terms of getting rid of the pathogen. We will need both the cell mediated immunity and inflammatory responses in order to mount an effective immune response to the pathogen and to get rid of it. Um, if uh, the cell-mediated immune system is hyperreactive, doesn't work very well, uh, then um, we would become more susceptible to infections 
autoimmune diseases, cancer, arthritis, and, and so forth. On the other hand, if the inflammatory responses are uncontrolled and overreactive, then we become more susceptible to a, another series of diseases, mainly chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, neurological disorders, and um, pulmonary diseases, as uh, you have been hearing a lot about uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, now, nutrition is very important to optimize both the cell-mediated immune response and the inflammatory responses. We know that if you have deficiency or uh, not necessarily overt deficiency, but insufficiency of many of the nutrients, uh, actually all of the nutrients, you can impair the immune response to an infection and then become more susceptible to infection. We also know that in cases of undernutrition, um, there is higher inflammatory response, uh, which would not be, be as easily controlled as we would normally control and you know, go back to, to what would be considered the normal inflammatory responses. There's also so something that is very interesting, and that is that the infection itself can impact the nutritional status. For example, if you have flu infection, the level of some of the antioxidant nutrients like vitamin E and vitamin C goes down in the lung. And so your need for some of these nutrients becomes more. Why is this important? Because one in three of the global population is suffering from what is referred to as hidden hunger or micronutrient deficiency. And I wanna tell you that we, when we talk about nutritional deficiencies, we might think about uh, less developed countries, but that's not necessarily true. There are segments of population in the developed world that also have micronutrient and other nutritional insufficiencies. So it's not just, uh, we can't think that this does not apply to, for example, US. And I'll tell you some examples of that um, shortly. Now, the other things that impact this relationship between nutrition, immune and inflammatory responses and infection uh, is obesity, which is sort of overnutrition, and also aging. Um, and as you know, um, both of these factors are becoming more and more important because 13% of the global population is obese and that number is actually much higher in the uh, more developed countries. It, it uh, approaches something like 40%, for example, in US. We also know that uh, about 9% of the global population is over the age of 65. And again, that number is double in more developed countries um, and, and uh, in uh, including US. The reason that is important is that both aging and obesity can cause dysregulation of immune and inflammatory responses so that cell-mediated immunity, and particularly, for example, uh, T-cell function, which is very important in terms of fighting with viruses and, and bacteria, and also in terms of uh, production of antibodies against um, viral um, infection in collaboration with other cells of the, the immune system, that part of the immune system does not function as well. On the other hand, there is hyperactivity of inflammatory responses with both aging and with obesity so that there is more, uh, what is referred to, for example, in case of aging as inflammaging, there is you know, higher chronic sort of an inflammation going, which is believed to contribute to the higher incidence of chronic diseases in the older population. And similarly, the decline in T-cell mediated function is believed to contribute to higher incidence of and susceptibility and morbidity and mortality from infectious diseases in older people and as well as and in obese individuals. Now, how does nutrition affect um, infection? Uh, there are many ways that nutrition can impact our susceptibility and how we respond to infection. One way is that it could interfere with the way that the pathogen can enter the cells of the body. Uh, second, it can uh, change how our cell-mediated immune response um, 
um, response to an infection. It can impact vaccine efficacy. Um, and it also can change morbidity due to infection by regulating oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, there's also evidence that nutrition can impact pathogen virulence. We know that, for example, in case of certain uh, deficiencies such as selenium or vitamin E deficiency, certain viruses become more virulent. Um, and um, there is another way that nutrition can impact indirectly how the immune system responds, and, and that is through changing the composition of the gut microbiome. There is a concept that I want to uh, make sure that uh, everyone is familiar with because it's uh, the sources of a lot of misunderstanding and I think um, misinterpretation. Uh, the relationship between nutrition level, the nutrient level and immune function is not necessarily a linear relationship in that it's not true that you, know, you can uh, continue to increase the level of nutrient and enhance the immune response. What we know is that if you have deficiency of the nutrients, you certainly can impair the immune response. And then as you correct that deficiency, you reach an optimal level of nutrient, which causes an optimal immune response. But increasing the level of nutrients beyond that optimal level would not necessarily further improve the immune response. Now, there is that this optimal level of nutrient can for optimal immune function can change because of the age or because of, for example, obesity or being exposed to a stress or other condition. But nevertheless, there is always an optimal level and higher is not always better. I wanna give you some examples of how uh, nutrients can impact immune response. And I've just selected some of the nutrients that people have been interested in and they've been in the news this in the recent years, particularly because of COVID-19, but that does not mean that these are the only ones who can impact the immune system. One of the nutrients is vitamin E that you can find in oils and in nuts and in, in, the, um, in plant oils and, and, and so forth. We there's a good amount of evidence that if you have vitamin E deficiency, of course, you can impair the immune system. Uh, there's not uh, much of a discussion there. What is interesting is that vitamin E supplementation beyond what is currently recommended of healthy older people has been shown to significantly improve the in vivo and in vitro um, indices of the cell mediated immune function. And let me give you some example, an example of that. This is a study that we have done several years back where we uh, took healthy older people and supplemented them with either a placebo, 60, 200 or 800 international units of vitamin E for uh, four and a half months. And then we uh, looked at the response to uh, vaccine. In this case, we use hepatitis B vaccine. And we also looked at some other indices of cell mediated immunity, which is referred to as DTH. As you can see, um, the level of uh, all of the three supplemented groups had better vaccine response and better DTH response. But the optimal level in this case was 200 international unit and the 800, which was the higher level, was not necessarily better, was not the optimal um, le level for these responses. Um, we've also, what is also interesting is that vitamin E can control the inflammatory response to viral infection. This is using an animal model of influenza infection. What you're looking at in the left-hand panel is the um, is animals who um, data from animals who were given a control diet or a, vit a, su um, a diet supplemented with vitamin E. You're looking at the level of vi virus in the lung of the animals, and you can see that vitamin E supplemented animals significantly had lower viral uh, titer in their lung. What is also interesting is that. The with in response to the viral infections, there is increase in the level of inflammatory cytokines. In this case, this is a cytokine called interleukin-6, 
Um, and you can see that the animals who were given vitamin E did not have such a heightened uh, inflammatory response uh, in response to the viral infection. Sim you can see the same thing with another inflammatory cytokine TNF alpha, which is shown on uh, the right hand side panel. So vitamin E can improve uh, the response to uh, the vaccine and in general, the cell mediated immune response, but can also control the um, inflammatory responses. We then did a study in humans in which we uh, looked at a, a supplementation of vitamin E in nursing homes and we um, randomly supplement uh, assigned uh, uh, about 600 uh, nursing home residents to either a placebo or a vitamin E uh, supplement and observe them for a year. And then we documented their respiratory infections. And what you can see is that uh, we saw a significant reduction in all respiratory infections, uh, particularly in upper respiratory infections and common cold. Just to note uh, that the, a lot of the common colds are caused by a type of coronavirus. They're not the virulent type that we're seeing like COVID-19, they're more of a benign type, but there is, uh, uh, I wanted to make that, that um, uh, point that out. Uh, now, another uh, nutrient that has been a lot in, in, in the news is, is zinc, which is found in most, mostly in animal uh, products. Uh, there are several groups, uh, even in the uh, developed countries, that are uh, at risk for zinc deficiency, including children, uh, adolescent females, and older uh, adults. So we uh, actually looked at the, the, the proportion of uh, older adults who were zinc deficient in nursing homes and also in independently living elderly, and notice that 30% of the nursing homes in and around the Boston area, um, the residents of these nursing homes, 30% of them had a low serum zinc level. And 22% of independently living uh, elderly, uh, and this is data from Wisconsin, had low serum zinc level. Now, why is that important? Because we were also able to show that the older people who had low serum zinc level had twice as much pneumonia compared to those who had adequate serum zinc level. They also had higher duration of pneumonia and more antibiotic prescription and higher duration of antibiotic use. Now, we uh, followed this by a smaller study in which we supplemented older people who were zinc deficient with 30 milligram per day of zinc for three months and looked at their uh, immune response. And what we found was that um, supplementing these older uh, adults who were zinc deficient uh, significantly improved their serum zinc level as well as their T cell function. Now, what we are currently working on is to see whether supplementation with uh, zinc would actually improve resistance of the older adults to pneumonia. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to share that information sometime in the future. Now, others have looked at uh, zinc uh, and common cold, and there have been several studies that have been done. And this is a, a, a meta-analysis, which is a, a sort of combining the results of the different studies together to look for the strength of evidence uh, about an efficacy of a treatment. Um, and what they found by, by doing this is that from all these different studies, zinc did not necessarily have an impact in terms of the risk for common cold, but it did improve or shorten the duration uh, of the symptoms for common cold. Um, another uh, nutrient that has been in the news uh, again is vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is interesting because it has been shown to increase the expression of antibacterial proteins and it has been able to, the vitamin E supplementation has been, vitamin D, I'm sorry, supplementation has been shown to 
limit certain aspect of the acquired immune response, which is involved in autoimmune diseases. And in a lot of animal models and some human studies do show that high um, vitamin, vitamin D supplementation is effective in um, sort of controlling autoimmune diseases. In terms of um, response to infections, there is, uh, however, some controversy related to uh, vitamin D supplementation. There are some studies showing that it can reduce the risk of upper respiratory tract infections, but there are also some studies that have shown no effect. So the jury is still out in terms of respiratory infection and vitamin D. Another nutrient that I know everyone likes to know about is vitamin C. There has been a lot of interest in that, um, uh, but, um, uh, and the reason for it is that, uh, that the immune cells accumulate and concert vitamin C and then quickly use it up during an active immune response. So there's always been this idea that, so therefore we need to be giving more vitamin C. However, um, the scientific ev evidence uh, regarding the effect of vitamin C supplementation on immune function um, is, has been mainly hampered because of the several, uh, be because of the type of the studies that have been conducted that have not really been up to standards. I mean, there's been a lot of shortcoming in terms of the way the, the studies have been done. So there's a lot of controversy related to vitamin C and, and immune response. I believe that if the right type of studies are done, we might see some effectiveness of vitamin C on the immune system. But unfortunately, the type of the studies that have been done so far do not leave us with a conclusive, conclusive evidence about vitamin C and immune uh, response. Uh, and the same is also true in terms of um, infection. There are some studies that show vitamin C, for example, to be effective about, uh, for common cold, but there are also equal numbers of studies that show it not to be um, effective. And again, I believe that is, um, a lot of it has to do with, with uh, methodological problems in, in the studies, for example, uh, not using the right level of vitamin C. One thing that is commonly seen in a lot of the, the uh, studies with nutrients is that everyone tries to just use the highest level possible thinking that that's the best level. But as I indicated before, that is not necessarily true. They don't take the time to find the optimal level first and then do a larger study. And so it's, it's uh, the, the studies that the results have not been very conclusive related to vitamin C. Now, let me spend a few minutes to talk about um, coronavirus, which is on top of everyone's mind. Uh, as, as you know, there are several types of human coronaviruses. Some of them induce mild and moderate um, disease, um, including 229E and, and so forth that cause common cold, for example. Um, there, but there are also pathogenic versions of this virus that have um, that we've seen in the past and currently with COVID-19 that can cause severe disease. Um, this is a picture of the virus that causes SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. Uh, what is very interesting is this uh, sort of protrusion, uh, spike type protrusion out of the, um, the structure of the virus, which gives it this, the, the name, which uh, makes it look like a crown. And so it's called a coronavirus, which, um, uh, and, and um, the abbreviation of the disease is COVID-19. And these spikes are very important because they are the entry level to the cells of the immune system so that they can bind receptors on the surface of the cells in order to enter the cell and then use the machinery of the cell to reproduce. Now, there are two, uh, when the, the, the immune, uh, the, when the cells see the coronavirus um, or SARS-CoV-2, uh, there are two phases of response. The phase one of the response is the viral entry uh, that causes a specific immune response to eliminate the virus and preclude its progression to the severe stage. Um, if that stage is successful, we get, you know, you have mild symptoms and you get rid of, you don't have the severe type of disease. 
But if that stage is not successful, then you get to phase two, which has an inflammatory response, uh, which is out of control. And it has been referred to as the cytokine storm, which all of you are familiar with. And it causes the damage to the to lung and, and, um, and causes an uh, acute respir respiratory syndrome, which can result in death. Now, there are few nutrients that have been shown uh, that might have potential in terms of um, um, fighting uh, against uh, coronavirus. One of them is zinc. Uh, there's some biological reason to think that zinc might be uh, effective in addition to its role as regulation of the cell-mediated immunity. Zinc has been shown to inhibit um, coronavirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity, which is the enzyme that is essential in terms of duplication of the virus. This work has been done in vitro and not necessarily with SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, but with SARS-CoV, which is very similar to SARS-CoV-2 and causes uh, other um, sort of um, severe diseases. Um, by this type of uh, virus. Um, and and um, zinc ionophores, which increases the level of, of, of zinc in the cells, have been shown to inhibit proliferation of the virus in the cell. So that's promising, but needs to be tested with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2. Another um, a nutrient that has been shown that might be important in terms of defense against uh, COVID-19 is um, vitamin D. Uh, there was a small retrospective uh, study uh, which showed that the uh, patients who had more severe disease had lower serum vitamin D level compared to those who did not have the severe disease. Uh, that's um, encouraging. However, those patients also were older. Um, and so we don't know if this um, effect was because of the age or because of the low level of vitamin D. Uh, there are several studies that uh, are currently going on with vitamin D and also with zinc supplementation, looking to see whether in fact they can reduce severity uh, and risk for uh, COVID-19. But we don't have the results from and those trials yet. There's also a lot of interest with vitamin C and coronavirus, and um, there have been some anecdotal reports indicating that IV vitamin C may, may help people suffering from this disease. Um, and recently, even in US, that has become part of the uh, treatment protocol. Um, but uh, I don't think that we yet have conclusive evidence that vitamin C uh, is going to reduce severity of um, the disease. But again, there are several ongoing studies that are looking at the effect of vitamin C supplementation in patients with, corona, um, with COVID-19 to see whether in fact it can reduce the um, uh, it can reduce the severity of the disease. And I think it would be very interesting to see the results of uh, these studies as well as the ones with zinc and with vitamin D. Um, another uh, food component that has received a lot of interest in relation to COVID-19 is quercetin. And the reason for it is that uh, quercetin, who's found, which is found in things like apples and, and um, and um, onions uh, is a very strong anti-inflammatory compound. And there are studies from animals and some in humans that it can uh, reduce susceptibility and severity of some of the other viral diseases, not COVID-19. But what is actually quite interesting is that in computer modeling, uh, identified quercetin as a top uh, agonist to COVID-19 uh, S protein binding to host cells receptor. In other words, was the, 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 the strongest compound in terms of interfering with binding of these uh, spike protein to the receptor on the cells, which will inhibit uh, or reduce entry of the virus to the cell. This is all with computer monitoring and needs to be tested. In, in with cells and also in in, in vivo, uh, but I think it's 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 quite promising. 
And there is also some in vitro studies with not with SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, but with SARS-CoV, which is very similar to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, the in vitro studies with, the, with that virus shows that quercetin can uh, inhibit entry and proliferation of the virus in the cells. But that again is in vitro studies. So to uh, summarize in terms of, of, of um, nutrition and, and immunity, and, and particularly in relation to COVID-19, it is clear that we need to have adequate level of, of nutrients uh, in order to be able to have optimal both cell-mediated and inflammatory responses uh, to different pathogens. We have some evidence that higher uh, than recommend supplementation with higher than recommended level of some nutrients can be beneficial in terms of improving the immune response uh, and controlling the inflammatory responses, at least in the older uh, population. And, and um, I do want to emphasize that there are some groups that are at might have a different optimal requirement in terms of um, in terms of nutrients uh, to, to maintain a, a, a healthy immune and inflammatory response. And that does include older population, individ, uh, obese individual and, and those that might be under um, uh, stress. Um, and in particular, in terms of COVID-19, there's a lot of promising evidence, but we, um, which um, indicates that um, nutrient supplementation may be beneficial. Um, I have shown in this uh, cartoon areas where uh, there is potential for nutrition intervention or where nutrition could be uh, beneficial. As I mentioned, it could interfere with viral entry and viral proliferation, for example, with zinc and quercetin. It could improve specific adaptive uh, immune responses to the virus. For example, with vitamin E or with uh, with zinc or with um, uh, vitamin C, um, but it can also reduce inflammatory responses uh, or uncontrolled inflammatory responses. For example, with things like quercetin or EGCG or some of the antioxidant um, nutrients. And with that, I'm going to stop. And thank you very much for uh, coming to the to the webinar and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Min. It was a great overview of the current status of nutrition and uh, immunity and uh, in the context of COVID. And yes, there are uh, some questions. Uh, and there is one that comes kind of repetitive and that relates to uh, the interest of knowing if uh, people should take vitamin supplements at this point? And if so, what and in what amounts? Because you went a uh, kind of uh, piecemeal, right? Uh, nutrient after nutrient, but people are interested in, in the, the practical approach of uh, taking multivitamins. What is your opinion? Um, <laughs> so I think taking a multivitamin, it all depends on your your age, and it would also depend on, on um, your nutritional status. And I'm not trying to, uh, you know, weigh the question, but I do believe that for older people, because they are at risk for low consumption of several of the micronutrients, um, a multivitamin may be useful uh, in order to make sure that they have adequate level of the nutrients. Um, our studies show that zinc, um, if older people, uh, the older individuals who are, who have low zinc status, and you can check this, um, and uh, you might be surprised that you might be zinc, you know, have low, low zinc levels. For those people, I believe that you, they should be supplementing with zinc, not with very high levels, um, but with, with uh, perhaps a 30 milligram um, per day of, of zinc until they reach adequate level of serum, serum zinc. Uh, that could be very helpful. Our studies in the older population, healthy older population, um, suggest strongly that they could benefit from supplementation with 200 international units per day of vitamin E. Mm -hmm. um, 
And beyond that, I think um, the, the, there is some evidence for some of the other nutrients, but it's not enough to, for me to be able to go and, and recommend them. What I could uh, recommend is for people to be sure that they are consuming a lot of fruits and vegetables. And I'm not just saying that, it's because I think we have evidence from studies, preclinical studies that we have done that giving, consuming a high level of fruits and vegetables can actually um, improve your immune response and reduce the inflammatory responses. And fruits and vegetables do have a lot of the micronutrients that you would need. Now, if you can't, it might be difficult for some people to be consuming, I don't know, eight to nine serving of, of fruits and vegetables. But if you can do that, I think that's the best thing you can do in terms of making sure that your immune system stays healthy and you don't have overactive inflammatory responses. And, and I also mentioned some of the, some of the um, um, ingredient, uh, nutrients that I thought um, at least uh, a segment of the population could benefit from supplementation. In one of the studies that we did with um, pregnant obese women, we did notice that they have lower uh, level of some of the antioxidant nutrients. So, and, and there is impairment of the immune response and higher inflammatory responses in uh, associated with obesity. So perhaps for that population, making sure that uh, they take enough supplement to have adequate level of the, uh, the antioxidant nutrients will be beneficial. But that, as far as I can tell you with the current knowledge that we have. Okay. Well, we have many questions and we don't have uh, all the time, unfortunately. But uh, just continuing with the, uh, with the topic of uh, vitamin E, I have seen a question that is uh, really interesting uh, and practical these days. Uh, should we be taking vitamin E before getting vaccinated in order to enhance the immune response? Um, that's a very good question. I think I would say for older people, certainly our studies suggest that it will be beneficial because as you saw from the, the data, that uh, those, uh, the people who were getting, uh, at least the older people who were getting vitamin E had a better response to uh, hepatitis B, but also we looked at two other, uh, two other, um, um, uh, two, two, two other vaccine. Uh, and we have data from animal studies where we've looked at uh, influenza infection. It is in animals, but in animal studies, we were able to show that it does improve um, vaccine response in the animals. Um, uh, and uh, to, to influenza infection. I don't know um, specifically for COVID-19 vaccine that needs to be determined, but for these other type of vaccine, it has been effective. I think this is an, a really an opportune time to look at some of these um, questions in a, um, a systemic way um, and find the answer to them so that people know whether, would, is it helpful to take, you know, some a supplement like vitamin E before vaccination or not? And I think uh, we have some answers, but not all the answers to the question. Thanks, I mean, and uh, well, if we believe uh, the predictions, this will not be the last time. So hopefully the next time we'll be better prepared, right? <laughs> uh, with the knowledge that we accumulate now. Um, okay, so uh, we went from the multivitamins to the specific vitamin E. And there is a question that uh, I mean, I, uh, goes to the foods. And then um, the question is, do you agree in general with the whole foods plant-based nutrition advice of book authors like uh, Joel Foreman and uh, Michael Greger, or is there any other author whom uh, you could recommend over them? I mean, these are popular colleagues, right, that they uh, are in the uh, speaker circuit and uh, they write bo popular books and so on, and that they prime, you know, the precisely one of the issues that you mentioned, the fruits and vegetables and the micronutrients and so on. So do you have any 
First, do you agree with this? And second, do you have any preferred author that people uh, could, uh, could read? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have a favorite author related to, to that, but I would say that um, at least, uh, and, and you know, I spend a lot of time looking at individual nutrients, but in the last few years, we've been focusing on uh, whole food and what the impact of whole food is in terms of both infectious and chronic diseases. And one of the things that we've been doing is that we've looked at um, impact of a uh, mixture of fruits and vegetables at a higher level on the, both the immune response and inflammatory response of the uh, um, animals, as well as the way that would, they would age. In, in other words, in, in, in the health and lifespan of the animals. And so far, the results have been quite interesting. We are finding that by giving this mixture of fruits and vegetables at, at high level, uh, we can significantly improve the immune response and, and reduce inflammatory responses and some of the metabolic disorders that are associated with it and diseases that are associated with it. And um, while I don't have all the data yet, but we're seeing some very encouraging results in terms of the impact on the health span uh, of the animals. We don't know yet in terms of their lifespan. So I would say, I'm, I don't think that people need to go totally plant-based in order to see the benefit, uh, but certainly increasing the level of uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables and a mixture of them is going to be very beneficial. Okay. Well, I, I am trying to cluster questions, and obviously there are things that are not questions, like great presentation, thank you, Simin. Uh, but uh, so, and see, oh, there was a couple of questions <laughs> that they were identical. What about fresh versus frozen fruits and vegetables? Mm. Um, so I think that, that um, uh, if you have access to fresh fruits, that's great, consume them. Um, but frozen vegetables and frozen fruits can uh, be, uh, can, can work as well uh, if you don't have access to fresh fruits and, and it's hard because, you know, you can't, um, uh, you know, if you buy a whole lot of them, then they might go to waste and you can't go to the store every day. But I mean, I myself am a fan of fresh fruits, but I think that if you don't, if you can't keep up with that, then, uh, uh, frozen fruits and vegetables uh, are a very good uh, substitute. It's it's much better to have them than not having them. Okay, great advice. Thank you. Uh, there is one here connected with aging, and it says incidence of COVID, uh, number of cases and mortality rates have been lower in Asian countries. Is there any hypothesis on nutritional adequacy in older populations in these countries? So uh, there are some populations of in, in, in um, Asian countries that have higher longevity and, and um, um, but, but it's not for all of them. And uh, in general, for example, in Japan, there are a good number of, of um, people who live to be above the age of, of 100. And some of it has to do with their diet in terms of being consuming more of the plant-based type diets and more consumption of uh, fish. Um, and uh, I think, that, and the same, for example, in some of the European uh, countries, there have been connection made to the higher, um, the higher, I guess, longevity in uh, some of the Asian countries and in some of the European countries with uh, food, component of foods, for example, the, the fruits and vegetables or uh, consuming, for example, higher consumption of yogurt or, and things like that. So food certainly plays a very important role in terms of staying healthy as you age um, and having a, a more successful aging process. Okay, well, we are getting to the end of the time. However, I see a, still a very solid audience with us. So maybe we can scratch a few more minutes. 
uh, to answer a couple of questions. Uh, this is the mirror image to the, to the vitamin E question and the vaccination. The question says, should I stop taking curcumin before getting vaccinated? Hmm. I don't know how much <laughs> it depends on <laughs> depends on how much curcumin you're taking and um, and that is actually very very important if you take you know real if you're taking a very high level of curcumin I would say yes please stop because I don't know what high level of curcumin will do to your immune system um, but um, and and um, there is a danger of taking too much of an anti-inflammatory antioxidant because it could actually have an adverse effect on your cell-mediated immune response. So you need to be very careful. And I and this has become something that I want to I want to make sure everyone understands. There is a lot of things out there in the market with a lot of claims. But please read the, the dotted line very carefully because most of them don't have evidence to support the claims that is being made, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some good products out there, there are some good things, but a lot of them just um, don't have the adequate evidence to support the the claim that is being made. So read the literature that is related to them, not just what, what is offered by the manufacturers, but read the literature outside of that, read the independent literature to see whether in fact, what the claim, the claim that is being made is actually supported by scientific evidence. So if you're taking a very high level of curcumin, uh, I would stop uh, because I don't know what it does to your immune system. Okay. Well, maybe one more. Um, difficult to choose because there are good questions. But keep in mind that the questions will be uh, are recorded, uh, I, and they, they, there will be uh, emails answering some of the questions that we didn't get to answer uh, alive, right? Alive. And uh, do daily products contribute to inflammation? Um. So there is some, some literature out there indicating that, but uh, my conclusion or my sort of assessment of the uh, ev evidence that is out there is that um, unless there is a special issue in terms of lactose intolerance or some other type of allergy to the component of milk, um, I'm not convinced that the dairy products would contribute to inflammation. Um, very particularly fermented dairy products could have health benefits in terms of um, the gut microbiome and the impact that it would have in terms of the, uh, the immune system and inflammatory responses. Um, and there's a lot of good things in dairy products, um, both in terms of protein and some of the micronutrients that could be beneficial, particularly as you become uh, older. So uh, I'm not convinced that the dairy products can cause inflammation, again, unless you are particularly susceptible or have a reason um, that it might cause inflammation in you. Okay. So the, I will say the final comment is everything in moderation, right? Uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, the poison is in the, in the dose. Okay. I think uh, we are we have reached the end uh, of the of the meeting again. Thank you so much. It was great, uh, yeah. and that was the reflection of the comments of the audience also. And uh, yes, uh, as I said at the beginning, look at the chat because uh, there there are some important announcements, and uh, including uh, I think at some point the link to the next conference that will be uh, given by by Paul uh, Jakes. And with that, thank you so much again, Simin, and all the audience for this wonderful time that we share together. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good day, everyone. Okay.